Hey, welcome back to the podcast. We're here with Brian Will, and Brian is the industry expert in sales and management consulting. He is a best-selling author, and he has a Wall Street Journal and USA Today hit book called The Dropout Multimillionaire, and a book called Know the Psychology of Sales and Negotiations. So we're going to be talking about building a business, why businesses fail, and how you can build value in your business and so much more. So Brian, glad to be talking to you. Robert, thank you for having me on the show. This is awesome, man. I'm excited to be here today. And I'm excited to have you. It doesn't even matter who the guest is. You always get some insights. You always get some new perspectives. So what is your perspective? What's your passion? What's your focus these days? Gosh, I've spent a career, 30 some plus years building and selling companies. And my latest passion, and I still own a few. And my latest passion, however, is I've launched an executive CEO coaching business to work with entrepreneurs in the $1 to $10 million revenue range to really help them scale and solidify, stabilize, and get their companies ready for sale if that's what they want to do. And this is a, a an idea that I didn't even know was a thing up until maybe five or 10 years ago. We always think about uh, you know having an idea and building a business from scratch, and then it makes you money and makes you passive income. But then it turns out that this whole entire time, there's been this subsection of all these entrepreneurs that they sometimes will buy a business, fix it up, build it and sell it, or just be like these serial entrepreneurs and keep building things up and selling it and finding a new idea. And it's just, it's amazing this whole world that's out there. And so what is the the secret? Is it just a matter of like failing fast and being fearless and hiring people and systematizing or all of the above? Like, why is it that there's like so many entrepreneurs, business owners don't even know about this or don't do this versus there's people like you that just are like kind of the serial successes? A secret, the secret to serial entrepreneurship is ADHD. I say that half jokingly, but I also call ADHD my superpower. Uh, I'm very good at 30,000 feet directing a lot of different things, but I don't get involved in the details. And once I build them, I tend to get bored with the management of them because building and fixing is fun. Management is not. So when they get to a manageable stage, I will tend to sell them and move on. I have a chain of restaurants right now I've had for 10 years that we're going to put up for sale next year because it's it's I'm getting tired of it. And and that's great. And that, that kind of taps into this other idea that I feel, I feel like I hear about it every few years and I forget about it and hear it again, this concept of with entrepreneurs to not focus on your weaknesses, strengthen your strengths. And when we're growing up and we go to school and they try to mold us, they try to say, be more well-rounded, take these elective classes. But then when it is adulting mm -hmm. time, when it is that ADHD entrepreneurial time, then that is your, your chance to have that awareness and jump into things and then kind of break it down into pieces and say, okay, here's what I like to do. Here's what I'm good at. And then the other things that I don't enjoy or that don't really serve me, that still needs to get done, but I need to kind of have the kind of uh, the, the the psychological uh, like lack of ego and put put my feelings aside and have other people work on the pieces of the business. And so, I mean, would you say that's kind of a, on the right track sort of advice? Yeah. In my second book, The Dropout Multi-Millionaire, we talk about the four personalities inside of every successful business. And they are the entrepreneur, the manager, the salesperson, and the technician. The problem is too many people start businesses and they think that they are the entrepreneur or they think that they're the CEO. And the reality, they're not. They were probably the technician or the salesperson. And so one of what we call the five keys to success in business, we wrote this article for Forbes, is that the first thing you need to do if you're going to start a business, or even if you have one that's not scaling, is you need to figure out who you are in the business. And then you need to figure out who you aren't in the business. Too many people want to be a CEO, but they're not. A CEO is a manager. It's an administrative position. Most people that start businesses are entrepreneurs and they're not good at the detail management piece. So if you can figure out who you're not, or as you said, your weaknesses, and then you can backfill those weaknesses within your organization, check your ego, let somebody else have a title, let somebody else make decisions. If you can effectively do that, your chances of scaling that business and eventually having a big exit go up significantly. I love that. And uh, and whenever this sort of conversation comes up, the e-myth comes to mind, right? That it's really tempting mm -hmm. to have a, a, a job, a vocation, and then you say, oh, well, 
I worked for for 20 years as an accountant. I can just go and make an accounting business. But then if you're kind of working in your own business, then you just built yourself a, a less stable job. And then it seems like the, the secret that you've tapped into is instead of being instead of building a job, you build a business that you run and knowing kind of the those separate boxes. And so when you say that you're um you kind of you help others and you do this sort of mentorship, do you ever come across these business owners that they they don't have this awareness or is there is there the possibility of switching? Like if someone says, well, I built myself a job and I need to then be the business owner, is that possible or are they stuck in one of those four modes? No. So when you, when you, you called it not being self-aware and I call it an ego problem. Most people have an ego problem and that's what makes them not self-aware of the problems they're having in their organization. So if you go through the effort of hiring a coach or a mentor and bringing them in, the first thing you need to do is start listening to them. And when they tell, when they tell you, you have an ego problem and you need to check it and start listening and let other people make decisions and all those types of things. That's the first step towards your either eventual success or eventual doom. So it's that ego that is definitely the issue. That was the first part of your question. I can't remember the second part. Me, me neither. We were just kind of, kind of on a oh, roll. The other, <laughs> other, the other question was: Is it possible to to make the oh, change? Yes. Like, if someone says, "Okay, I know I have an ego problem. I need to to kind of let go of some of the control and let others make decisions." Easier said yep. than done. How is that possible? So here's the thing, and th again, this is part of my book. It's also part of the Rich Dad Poor Dad series. But the answer to the question is: You need to decide who you are and who you want to be. Right? There's a difference between being self-employed. I built a job for myself and building a business that can run without me. Neither one of those are better than the other, depending on what your personal goals are. If your personal goals are, I just wanna work when I wanna work and do what I wanna do and work out of the house and take off if I want to and not have the responsibility of employees and insurance and workman's comp and liability. If you don't wanna do all that mess, then be a solopreneur and be happy and make money. On the other hand, if you wanna build something with intrinsic value that eventually will be able to run without you, that you can walk away from and or sell, then you have to change your mindset and you have to build an actual business. So the first question I always ask an entrepreneur is, who are you and what do you wanna be? And if they wanna be a solopreneur, then that's fine. We'll make decisions based around that. If they wanna build a business that they wanna sell someday and they're not doing that today, then we might need to change some of those systems and processes within the business and put them in a position to get there. This whole uh, kind of being a solopreneur, I feel like it took me at least 10 years to figure that out. And then now I, I'm kind of in a point personally where like I want to be more of the, the business owner and I'm finding myself having to unlearn things and I'm experiencing like switching to new skills and experiencing like new forms of stress, right? Like when uh, like and dealing with a lot of mistakes as well, like handing things off to to employees and I kind of mess things up and then I have to hold myself back and say like, well, I don't want to fix the problem for them. I want them to fix it. Yep. And it just seems like there's there's more chaos than when I kind of had my fingers in all the pies. But then I also feel like I'm doing less work. I'm less jumping around, like putting out all, all the fires. And is that something that you, you hear a lot about when say like uh, someone goes from being like employed, a solopreneur, and then they want to be more of like the, the CEO, the boss, the delegator. Is there just like so much just inner conflict, stress, having to unlearn and learn new skills? Yeah, and I, I hear this a lot. The majority of the stress that you're speaking of is the entrepreneur's expectation that the people that they hire and bring into the business will perform at the same level and at the same competency that the entrepreneur does. And that's never going to happen. In fact, I tell people, if you can hire somebody that is 80% as good as you in these different roles, then you've done good. But you as an entrepreneur need to understand what you're building. And if you're building something that has value that you can walk away from, you're never going to hire a whole bunch of people that are as good as you, because if you did, they'd quit and do what you're doing. That, that's just a fact. Why would I work for you if I can do everything you can do, right? I'll go do it myself and I'll make all the money. So if you can get somebody 80% as good, and then you have to sit back and allow them to make mistakes and allow them to learn and understand that you're going to make less money originally in the, in the beginning because you're paying somebody to do something that's going to make mistakes. But eventually you will build an organization that'll be big enough and profitable enough that you can sell it and walk away with a large amount of money. So we're back to the ego. Don't expect people to be as good as you. Allow them to make mistakes. 
understand that you're building something for the long term. It's not about today. It's about next year, two years, five years, 10 years from now. I love it. it. And it all seems like it revolves around a different way of thinking and getting past some of these mental blocks. Like probably the, the obvious mental block for me was saying with that first one, you said like, there's no one as good as me. And then your answer to that is, well, maybe not, because if there was, they go and make their own business. So if you can find someone 80% as good as you, then that's more what you want. And the, for some reason, the metaphor that comes to mind is say you owned a McDonald's location. And you were the one like taking the orders and running in the back and cooking the, the burgers and answering the phones and just running nonstop. And you said, I can't sustain this. I need to hire people. But you would hire people that just did little jobs and then all added up and working together would kind of solve that problem. And then you'd have, a, but then instead of you keeping 100% or 80% of the money, all this goes to the difference salaries, employees, and then you have a little bit left over. And you're saying that that's these are all barriers that keep people from making the leap and systematizing and scaling. But then the the long game for that is that if you can sacrifice the the aggravation, the the less money, the overhead, all these little daily problems to solve, then you have something that can then be a, a package later to have your, your bigger payday instead of just the thing that like you, you give up the sustaining you now for the big payoff later. Yep. You need to do what you are the best at. And if you are an entrepreneur, you are the best at creating, selling concepts, building business. That's what you do. When you, is every, every hour or every minute you're wrapped up in the details of the business, you're losing on the big picture and you're not scaling. And are there like interesting techniques or strategies to avoid being so detail oriented? Is it a matter of like giving someone time to figure out solutions or figure out like SOPs or experiment? Like how do you avoid being the person that says, here's the exact system and structure, do this exactly my way. How do you give up some of that control? Building the SOPs is part of what you do as an entrepreneur. But once you've built the SOP, then you have to allow people to follow it allow them to make mistakes because every mistake that your employee makes that cost you money, you should consider that an investment in your future business. I, too many people, well, this person made a big mistake, so I fired them. Well, now you have to hire another person who's probably going to make the same mistake. If that person made a mistake and it cost you money, that's an investment into that person. As long as they never make that mistake again, you have a much better employee. Starting from scratch is crazy. We call this the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. The devil you know is a person that made the mistake. As long as they don't do that again, you're good. The devil you don't know is firing that person, hiring somebody else. You have no idea what they're going to screw up, right? So again, we're talking about building a long-term business. And uh, the best thing you can do if you are trying to move from solopreneur to business owner or even business owner that's business isn't growing to one that's scaling is literally, and I say this all the time, if you could go find somebody who just did what you did and was successful at it, wouldn't it be smart for you to go ask them a bunch of questions, how they did it and what they did right and what they did wrong? That's called coaching. Hire a coach, get a mentor, somebody that's been there, done that 20 steps ahead of you. It's already made the mistakes you're making, already made the, the wrong mental decisions that you're about to make because you are going to make them. Find somebody that can help you, bring them in and then listen to them and you will accelerate your growth significantly. What a concept. Get, get a coach, get a mentor, find someone yeah. that's already blazed the trail. So that way, instead of you having to reblaze the trail, you just ask them the, the questions. And for some reason, this conversation is linking my brain back to my past software life. When, when you make a piece of software and you ha have an idea of how you want it to look, then you can make a, like a prototype or like a first version really quickly. And it looks good and it kind of performs, but it's only like 10% of the way there. And it's, it's full of bugs. And then the real value over time is in the, the debugging and into finding the ways that you can break it. And that's kind of the more slow going through the mud, frustrating side of things because you're you're doing what's important, but you don't clearly see uh, mm -hmm. so much progress being made, but you're really like just plugging all the little uh, gaps, all the little holes. And it seems like it's kind of similar thinking as far as like finding these good hires and fixing the mistakes so that way they don't make the mistakes later. And it would be crazy 
if you were like Microsoft and you made Windows and you spent 15 years making it and so now the blue screens don't happen anymore. And then, but then one day you had a few more blue screens. You said, oh, I'm going to start completely from scratch on Windows version one. That would be crazy. But then if that's the 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 temptation for your business, then that, it does, doesn't make very much sense. And so we're here on a, a podcast here, Brian, and podcasts are fun to share stories and talk about mistakes and failures. And as a serial entrepreneur, I'm sure you're you're full of them, right? You're full of all kinds of those those stressful missteps. So to kind of uh, awaken and inspire some of our listeners, do you have any fun failure type stories to share with us that will really give us a, a just a fun ride? You know, my very first business I started was a landscaping business and I had no idea what I was doing, but I started it. Ended up building it up into seven franchises in the Atlanta area. And as always, I like to say we were doing really well until we weren't. And that business crashed and burned and I ended up losing everything. My house, my cars, everything. I had to sell everything I owned to get out of that disaster. And there were two huge mistakes I made in that business that I carried with me into every business and everything I've done moving forward. And the first one was 80% of my revenue was generated through one client. There are a lot of people that have their own business, but they have one client. They don't have a business. They're basically an employee for that client. And if that client goes away, so does your business, right? And that happened to me. I had one large contractor that was, was subbing all their work out to us and we lost it. I lost all my business. The second problem was I thought that business was going to last forever. And so I was not sufficiently putting away capital reserves to create a safety net in case something happened in my business. I was spending everything I had. I was spending the money. I lived a good life. I had a Mercedes. I thought I looked good and smelled good. It was awesome. But when I lost that one client and then lost my business, I ended up losing everything because I didn't have any financial reserves to act as that safety net. And we couldn't pay the bills, couldn't pay the bills, started bouncing checks all over the place. It bounced like 130 checks in one month. It's like $3,000 in bounce check charges back then. The bank sends you this letter and says, you're no longer welcome in our branch. And by the way, you owe us $3,000. Now go away. Uh, crazy times. But I have used those two lessons in every business moving forward to not get too wrapped up in one client and always carry a solid, solid financial reserve to take care of us in case we get in trouble in any business that we're in. So those are two big ones. I love it. And that's another one of those secrets that for some reason people don't won't talk about. They like to talk about the the successes and like the, the, the massive quantum leaps and the living large. But then uh, again, only a few years ago, did I hear about this idea of if you are a business of any kind, put away, you know, 30%, 50% of be just so that way you're, you're way ahead for those kind of th those rough months. And especially if uh, the the worst case scenario happens or just to just to plan for the future don't don't live for uh like for today live for tomorrow covid washed out so many weak business owners not because their business wasn't okay before covid it's that when covid hit they weren't prepared for any kind of blip and it just wiped them out and they were gone and the people that had prepared had reserves were able to work through it were left standing and their businesses are probably bigger than they were today or bigger today than they were then and every decade, right? Any kind of economic upset, recession, same idea. It, it weeds out the the weak hands, and uh, so and and also it seems like maybe a, a good strategy, a good solution for what you're talking about in a, in our entrepreneurial journey in our business is to have kind of that blend of the focus and the experimentation, right? Because it seems like you want to double down on what's working. If you have that that big client, then then grow that. But then also kind of do the the the, the side projects or are the alternatives, not so much where it takes away from the focus of what's working, but so that way you have a backup plan uh, it, when your business does eventually need to evolve when the present stops working. And by the way, all businesses need to evolve. Think of any business out there. IBM started making typewriters. Apple started making motherboards. Neither one of those companies do those anymore. Every business evolves and yours must evolve too or eventually it will go away. And you hear about these things like the the blue ocean strategy and look into what will put you out of business and how Blockbuster stayed the way they were. And and yep. heck, if Netflix stayed the, the way they were with just DVDs, then they'd be in trouble too. So I, I love that advice. And that's always the kind of thinking that I love to be tapping into is just that 
whatever you'd call it, like the, the visionary, creative, larger than life advice of what's the, the next thing, what's the crazy risk I'm going to be taking uh, into the, the future, knowing that the business is working now, but then uh, times change. And so would yep. you say with all of your, uh, with your experiences, with your books, with your coaching, is there something with us entrepreneurs and business owners that is not being discussed enough or not being thought of enough? Anything that you think needs more attention? Yeah. So I'll give you, I'm going to break this into two parts. The first thing I tell business owners is if your business is not scaling the way you want, it's not as profitable as you want, you need to check your ego and come to the realization that it's your fault. That's just as, that's as simple as I can say it. It's your fault. And it's not that you're a bad person. You just don't know how to do what it is you want to do. And the example I will use is that I use Apple again, Apple computer, right? It's run by a guy named Tim Cook. Apple's one of the biggest companies in the world. Tim Cook runs one of the most profitable companies out there. He's clearly genius level individual to be able to do this. And yet Tim Cook has 12 people that come in every three months and sit down at his big boardroom. And they all sit down with their Jimmy Johns and they say, hey man, what's going on, Tim? And he goes, well, here's my problems with Foxconn, with China, with taxes. And, and they all say, okay, well, based on all of our collective experience, we think that you should use these decisions moving forward with Apple. And he goes, those are great ideas. I'm going to do that. That's called his board of directors. And then the board of directors also pays for Tim Cook, most people don't know this, to have a personal coach who goes behind the scenes with him and talks about how he's doing and how he's managing things and how his mental state is and what's going on. If Tim Cook needs 13 people to come in and help him, what makes you as a young entrepreneur think you don't need anybody? I love it. That is powerful. That is wonderful that you're not better than Tim Cook. Uh, get that extra advice get that coach and don't go it alone because you only have one brain. It makes a lot more logical sense to have multiple brains working on the project. And so if someone says, man, this guy, Brian Will, I'm blown away by his advice. I want to check out what he has going on with his businesses and his books and just to find out more, what's the next step? What's the call to action? Brianwillmedia.com is my website. My books, my podcasts, my coaching programs are on there. It's called The Force Multiplier. We do one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching. I do one-day sales training seminars. We do all kinds of stuff. So brianwillmedia.com is, is where you can get everything about me. Fantastic. Well, if you got a, a taste of Brian on the podcast and you like what you what you saw and heard and you say, now I want the entire meal, then the next logical step is to go to brianwillmedia.com. That's will with two L's. So that is B-R-I-A-N-W-I-L-L. -L M-E-D-I-A.com, brianwillmedia.com. And you can see what Brian has as far as that sales training and his books and everything else that you have going on. So go there right now while it's still fresh on your mind, even before the podcast is over, because guaranteed the phone will ring, you'll get distracted and something will take you away from going to brianwillmedia.com. So as we're going over there right now to the website, as we're winding down our conversation here, Brian, is there any final lasting parting words of advice you feel like sharing with us? Do you have a favorite lesson, moral, quote, et cetera? Your success and your future is literally in your hands. It is completely up to you. No matter what your background, no matter what challenges, I've had more challenges than most people can handle. Your success is in your hands. You can do anything you want to do as long as you're willing to learn the lessons to get there. I love it. You can do it. The future is up to you. And right now, your immediate future is to go to brianwillmedia.com. We will see you there. And thank you very much, Brian, for sharing with us your, your tips and lessons on how to execute and go through failure and achieve success. It's right there behind you on the wall. It's on brand. So I appreciate your advice and I appreciate you too, Brian. Robert, thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it.